Okay, we should be live just about now. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Wood from draft to digital Thanks for showing up today. Uh, I've got here with me Will Dages from Find A Way Voices. Hey, everybody. How are you doing today? Dan? Hey. Good. Thanks for having me. You're very, very welcome. I like your background. That's very, uh, the tree is Thank very you. awesome in the background there. Thank you very much. My work from home setup is taking over my daughter's office. And so this is oh. the decal on the wall behind me here. So. <laughs> I, I, I guess that's better than having like uh, My Little Pony behind you all the time. It's Yeah, it's good. It's so, not as classy as yours though, man. It looks like you should uh, have like a glass of bourbon in your hand and like it's classy. You know, what you don't know is I've got a mahogany desk right in front of me <laughs> and my bourbon is just off the side in one of those, you know, old fashioned globes that opens up with the alcohol. Love it. Smells of rich mahogany. Yes. It's, it's fun. So uh, brought you here today. You've been on our Ask Us Anything before, um, and that was by far, I think, our most watched Ask Us Anything because there's just a oh. ton of interest in oh. audiobooks right now. And so we wanted to have you back on for these spotlights. Um, you know, we know everyone, uh, not everyone, but most people are stuck at home right now. And so just, it's just like a, a quick little thing where you can hear more about uh, things that can help your publishing business as well as ask some questions if you're with us live. Um, so with that all said, uh, let's go ahead and start talking about Find A Way of Voices. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Find A Way of Voices can help you both with producing an audiobook if you don't have one, and then can also help you with um, distributing that book. And so much in the same way that draft to digital can get your eBooks everywhere in the world, uh, find a way can help you get your audiobooks out there to everyone. So we're going to talk about production today, distribution, and then just some marketing tips, because for those of you who have audiobooks, um, it is a little bit different than uh, how marketing works for print and for eBooks. And so uh, first of all, Kind of what you guys are, are I think, most well known for, uh, like at least with Find A Way Voices, is the production side of things. And so, could you talk a little bit about that and that process? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, to, to, to back up just a minute, like I've heard a lot of people say, oh, so you guys are like draft to digital, but for audiobooks. And so, if you're familiar with draft to digital, probably because you're watching this, that is a good way to kind of think about it. We help you make your book, we help you distribute your book. You don't have to make your book with us to distribute with us, you can bring it from anywhere. Uh, but it's that one, you know, you upload it one place and we send it out everywhere. We're the wide option for audiobooks. So uh, the way we make audiobooks is uh, a little bit different than what you might be used to if you're coming from ACX. ACX, you know, is an, an open marketplace where you can kind of shop around. And we take a much more personalized approach. So we have a casting team in-house that gets to know all of our narrators, the narrators that sign up with Findaway Voices. We have uh, I believe over 4,000 narrators signed up with wow. Findaway Voices right now, which, awesome. you know, AC ACX has 100,000. We have 4,000, but we're not trying to, you know, we're, we're not trying to get everybody in the world. We're trying to really select it, be selective and, and have high quality roster of narrators that we can choose from. And then our, this is where our casting team comes in, right? Because when an, when an author comes in with a project, we ask them a whole bunch of questions about, about the book, about what they're picturing, like what, what is that, what's the sound alike voice that you think you want? And we do all the work of sorting through the database of narrators to find just kind of like a semi-final list of five to 10 narrators who we, in our expertise, think would be a fantastic choice for your particular audiobook. This is not some algorithm, this is not a computer spitting it back, this is a real human team. So it does take a couple days too, but you're getting that personal approach. And when you get your casting list from somebody, you're gonna see that person's name, and you're going to be able to ask that person questions. And if you don't like it, you'll give feedback to that person. And that casting agent will also do the next casting for you. And they'll stick with your project. So you're not being passed around. It's really, it's a really personal service. And it's That's excellent. very attractive. Yeah, it's very attractive to somebody who's never made an audiobook before. It's attractive to somebody who's never heard an audiobook before. We have a lot of authors saying the, the process like overwhelms me because I have no, like, I don't even know what an audiobook is supposed to sound like. How can I make a good one? Right. And this is where we come in and like our, our casting agents are casting books all day, every day, uh, since the day we launched. And so we know the narrators really well. We're really good at picking out uh, great fits for the book because really like the number one most important thing about your audiobook is getting the voice right. Definitely. If you have the wrong voice for your book, if you are not uh, picking a voice that's right for your genre, 
right? There, a lot of genre readers are used to this type of voice. And if you go something way off the wall, it'll, it's gonna turn them off. If uh, it's a scratchy voice, you try to do it yourself and it just doesn't sound good or like all those things, it just completely ruins the audiobook. So one of the- You don't really want like a Southern things. accent for an epic fantasy. You probably want the, uh, <laughs> some the British. Some things just don't fit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some things just don't fit. And and our casting team is really good about that. And we'll guide you. If you say you want, you know, a Southern voice for an epic fantasy, uh, like we'll talk to you about that. And we'll say, okay, well, tell me, tell me why. Maybe it contextually really makes sense right. for yours. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, I hear we, about that really a lot know from uh, authors who started a, with ACX and were just overwhelmed. It's like, hey, here's a hundred thousand people pick a voice. And they were like, what in the world? And I, I think the the author community maybe listens to audiobooks a little bit less than the average community because I've also heard so many of them that have told me, you know, I just don't listen to audiobooks, so I don't really know what they should sound like. Um, I know many of the narrators often will bring their own audience as long as you're like kind of adjacent in genre to uh, what the listeners are, are listening to. And so getting that right one is essential. Yeah, there's there's some listeners out there who will follow narrators just as much as they follow authors, and and, and you and you can imagine that, right? Like you've heard some people talking, you're like, oh my gosh, I'd li I'd listen to them reading the phone book to me. Yes, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. those kind of people. If they're in your genre, you want that voice. And uh, it's, it's like how we all want to hear like Morgan Freeman narrate everything, <laughs> or uh, Samuel L. Jackson reading uh, children's books. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's people have certain voices that are uh, really fit the times and fit uh, storytelling. And so that's really cool yeah. um, to kind of back up a little bit for those of the uh, authors that are very new to audio um, about how many words is a finished uh, audio hour, because generally you're going to be charging uh, how much the audio book cost to produce is going to be by um how long it is per finished hour. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Per finished hour. Yeah. This is good. This, I mean, this dives into the number one most asked question that we get, which is how much does it cost to make an audiobook? So mm -hmm. this is the, kind of the precursor question to that. So we'll get to that next, but the way you convert that, the mental math for me, because I'm not, I'm not big into mental math, 10,000 words equals one hour of audio. Now, if you want to get a little bit more specific, some of the, the calculations that we use are based on 9,300 words, which is a yeah. little bit more accurate for the average. But you know, if you're thinking hundred thousand word audiobook, about 10 hours that, yeah. you know, just, just divide by 10 and you're, you're about good there. So um, 10,000 words per hour. And in, in audio, in the audiobook world, you pay by the finished hour. So it could take a narrator anywhere between three and six hours of wall clock time to make a finished hour of audiobook time. Right. So, so, I mean, they make mistakes, they stumble, they get the intonation wrong. They accidentally say something in the wrong voice. They got to back yeah. up, record that again, and then go into the editing studio and make sure everything's right. And then master it to specs and get it out, out there. So the editing, the mastering, the, the proofing, the, the re-records all adds up to a big multiple of what the finished product is that the author and the listeners actually see. So, so the, the industry standard is to build based on per finished hour. So you're Makes only sense, yeah. paying for the output. But that's why when you when you look at it, you're like, oh my gosh, two hundred yeah. bucks an hour. They're it's not like, making. Man, I need that job. Hour. But yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's so much more work. Either you know, I, I think a lot of it comes down on the narrator, but there's also some of the production behind uh, to take out, like if the background noises or to uh, to catch things. I, I know. Well, hopefully, there's no background noises in in yeah. the recording environment. But yeah. you know, if you if you have those kind of problems, like. Those are really hard to fix, and those are really intensive time, uh, like time intensive to fix. And sometimes they just can't be fixed. Yeah, you, you know, just like start over. if you have the heater on in the background and it's popping on and off and on and off, which actually mine just popped on and off. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna I can't turn that off. Hear it, but then again, my example. hearing is lousy. Yeah. <laughs> I should know better by now. I'm the audiobook guy. There's so much pressure on these things. Like um, right yeah. before this, I was like, oh, are my AirPods charged enough? Do I have like my backup headphones? <laughs> like I can't be the audiobook guy who cuts out in the audio here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So so the next question that I kind of want to lead into there, now that you know how it's built, how much does it cost to make your audiobook, right? And so the, all the narrators that we work with are independent contractors. They set their rates. We don't set the rates at all. And so they can set their rates uh, for whatever they want. Generally speaking, you're looking for a, a good narration somewhere between 150 to 300 bucks per finished hour. You know, if you're in that in that sweet spot right in the middle there, you're going to get a really good quality production. 
I feel like you guys have done a great job bringing that down because I feel like 300 was kind of like the average for a long time. And then uh, when Find a Way of Voice this kind of came out, you helped lower some of those costs, I think, with the technology and just helping find new narrators. So that's been really good. Yeah, I mean, I can't I can't take credit for that, you know, because I don't have any like we don't have any influence on the prices that narrators are setting. You know, we're just um, you know, the, the, the pricing is what it is and it's it kind of like an open market and people will sign up at whatever rate they have and they go into the roster and then we present it to the, the authors and usually in that list of five to 10 narrators that our, our, um, our casting agents present, there's usually a range. You know, we try to give some variety of so like, here's what $150 per finished hour sounds like, here's what $300 per finished hour sounds like. We don't have a ton in like the 450, 500, 600, 700, 800 dollar per finished right. hour. We have done those before, and it's incredible what you get for 800 dollars per finished hour. Like it is amazing, I bet. but it's not it's not the right choice for most people, and that's totally fine. But you know, it's just kind of the market. Just kind of it just it is what it is there. So before we move on to distribution, I wanted to, to take a minute to. Uh, in general, these are going to be single casts. Like you're going to just have one narrator who is going to do all of the voices. So they're going to do the female parts. They're going to do the male parts, regardless yep. of their own gender. Um, they're going to need to be able to do whatever accents that you're very, uh, you know, in your book that you are calling out. Um, and so that's some of the stuff that they're casting uh, really, really helps you with. Uh, but that is normal. I know a lot of authors who haven't listened to audiobooks are thinking they're going to have like a male and female narrator. And that's really very rarely the case because it's very, very expensive. Um, yeah. And it's just not what it's not what yeah. listeners are used to. Right. Yeah. It, 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 because it's expensive, not many do it. And because not many do it, the people who listen to audiobooks all the time, they're used to hearing female narrators do male voices right. and vice versa. Now, it, and, and a lot of authors that come to us. Uh, just by default, assume that I got two main characters. I'm gonna ha- that are different genders. I'm gonna need two narrators, and sometimes it can make sense if you have a dual point of view where it's like chapter one is the male point of view, chapter two is the female point of view, and you're going back and forth. That's actually not that hard to coordinate because you give each person their piece. But if you're gonna try to mer- mesh together the dialogue, you know it's really hard to do that in a convincing way unless both of those narrators are in the same studio looking at each other. <laughs> yeah, and, and it gets that really just the cost and it same thing really for like an ensemble cast. Like you do hear every once in a while, there are major books or plays that have been produced with four or five different voices. They had to get all those people into the same town in the same studio to make sure everything sounds the same. And so yep. it's just unusual. So I want to make sure people were realize that. Um, the other but, thing, but again, is, it's just, it's not just the cost; it's yeah. the expectation of the listeners. Yeah, they're used to it. They're used yeah. to hearing those voices. And I, I would say, if you are particularly worried about that, I would make sure that when you do your audition with Find Way Voices, because you get to upload about five minutes of audio that the narrators will read for free and no commitment. Like you get to hear a snippet of your book read by many different uh, narrators so that you can kind of compare apples to apples. Uh, make sure that that has uh, some, some you know, uh, two, different, um, two different characters being narrated in it. So you oh, can yeah. hear how this person is performing both genders. You, you don't want to pick audition. like the first chapter. You want to pick one of the hardest, like something that's got a lot of characters uh, I imagine with romance, you want to make sure the person is comfortable reading uh, about the sexy time. And so, you know, maybe have someone read something that might make them uncomfortable. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you're working with Find a Way, they're going to know who is big in romance anyway. And so they can help yeah. you with that. Yeah, um, and we help guide you through the audition process too. The, the other thing I hear people ask a lot, because I'm at a lot of conferences with you and uh, back when Kelly was with Find a Way, uh, is about self narration. And so, mm-hmm. When is that a good idea? When is a bad idea? So I will say one of the times it's a good idea is if you already have like a speaking career or your voice is already part of your brand. Say you're a big podcaster, like Joanna Penn, right? Like, right. Mm-hmm. do you really want to hear Joanna Penn's nonfiction in any other voice? No, you want to hear Joanna Penn narrate that that book. It just makes sense. And her voice is so much a part of her brand that it makes right. sense. Um, and yet I think fiction, she pays people to make a lot of her audio. I think she's done some of her audio books, but... Um, I, she's I don't, doing yeah. more and more herself. Yeah, even her on, on yeah. her fiction, and which, she's which, really which, good at it. She's really yeah. good at it. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. So if your voice is part of your brand, I think it makes sense. Now, in those cases, 
if you don't have the technical chops to do the editing and mastering to hit the specs, you may want to work with some kind of third party editor, master, right. audio engineer, which, um, you know, we don't, we don't right now offer those kind of services where you can, we, like, we, we don't have anybody with narrators kind of in our roster right now, but you can find those on like, you know, Fiverr or Upwork or, or, or any of those like freelancing sites. Um, or you can kind of ask around in the network and, and maybe we can even help you connect you with somebody good. But um, if you're gonna narrate yourself in fiction, I would say I would say there's very few authors who do it really well in fiction. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it's an easy job. So what I would do is I would, I would send you to your closet. I would lock you in your closet for an hour. And I would say, read these, read your book for an hour. And every time you make a mistake, back up and say it again, okay? And then uh, at the end of the recording, I want you to listen to the first minute and the last minute that you recorded. Do those characters sound exactly the same? Or did you drift a little bit? Or did you, you know, yeah. is the performance consistent? And now can you stand in a booth and do this for another 10, 15 hours? Some people can. I'm not saying it's not doable. There are a bunch of uh, uh, titles on Find Away Voices that are self-narrated and they sell very well, but it's pretty uncommon for it to be done really well. Yeah, uh, and it's I, a lot I would harder say than you think it is. Ninety-nine percent <laughs> of the people I know who are doing fiction end up just going with a narrator. Um, I, I have seen the cases like you have where nonfiction, where you have a brand or a, that kind of revolves around you and your voice, um, where it's more common. I think. Yeah. The the other bit of advice that I give is okay. Say, say you did that for an hour. You know you can do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You can still do an audition process with the professional narrators, right? And then oh, because yeah. I love I love testing and, and doing market research and data like this, this is, you know, this is where I geek out. Go ahead and do a blind test with your audience. Take a couple of your professional auditions, mix yourself in there once and, and say, uh, I'm having trouble deciding between these three narrators, narrator A, B, C, or one, two, three, don't give names or anything. Right. And then let your audience decide which one they like best. Because That's at the end of the day- strategy it's, too, like to involve them from the very beginning. So Absolutely. that when it comes out, they're like, oh yeah, I want to hear how that turned out. Cause I, you know, I picked that one versus this one. That's really exactly. And that's actually, that's actually a good reason why less is more yep. So maybe just have two choices or maybe three choices because everybody who, cho who votes for the winner is going to be like, I had a part, in the <laughs> yeah. book. you know, like I'm invested in this. I'm going to go buy that because I helped create this. Yeah. But you also might get some, some, um, you know, honest feedback that you're going to want to hear about your voice saying those, you know, narrating this book. You're going to want to know that before you invest all that time and, right. and, and make the book. Yeah. Let's move on to distribution. Um, sure. Like Will was speaking about earlier, uh, no matter if you have already produced your audiobook and want to get it to more places, um, or if you have it produced through Find A Way, or even if you produce it through ACX, but you decided not to be exclusive with Audible, uh, Find A Way, you upload the ebook to or the audiobook to them. And then they can help you get to a lot of places, including the one I'm most excited about is the library systems. And so yeah. uh, let's talk about distribution. Where all do you go? I mean, I know you go to a lot of places, so you might have to generalize some, but. Yeah, no, it's a good point to, to reiterate that it doesn't matter where your audiobook was produced, you can still upload it to us as long as it's not exclusive. And if it was exclusive with Audible and you're thinking about not being exclusive anymore, that's cool too. We actually have a landing page at uh, findawayvoices.com slash more. That kind of lit, that lists out all the all the steps to do that. It gives you some help. It helps you understand, you know, if are you in a royalty share or not. There's a whole flow chart of like, can I get out of exclusivity? And what a lot of people don't realize is if your book, if you're not in royalty share and you just chose exclusivity with Audible, it's a seven year contract. But after the first year, you can request out of it. So if your book's been live for a year and it's not royalty share, you can go from exclusive to non exclusive. You do jump down to that lower royalty rate, but that means you can go to 40 other library and retail systems all over the world. It opens up a lot of opportunities and we're seeing a lot of people doing that. And it's becoming a very good business decision to do that. Um, we, we hit all the major retailers. We do distribute to Audible. Uh, we distribute to you know, Kobo, uh, Barnes and Noble, uh, Biblioteca on the library side, Scribd, uh, Google, Apple. We have a direct relationship with Apple. So even if your book is getting to Apple through ACX, you're going to want to go through us because the royalty rate is 45%, whereas your non-exclusive royalty rate through ACX is going to be 25%. So that's like 20 extra percent on every sale you make at, at Apple, yeah. which is not insignificant. Um, we have over 40 library and retail partners all throughout the world. We work with each one individually, and we have relationships with every one of them. Uh, and it's 
the marketing channels are the ones that are really exciting right now, especially with the times we're in. Yeah. I don't know about you, Dan. I, I know in Oklahoma City, you have like an unbelievable library system. It's one of the best in the world. It really is great, yeah. It's fantastic. And But I have a couple different local libraries, like the county library and my city library, and I've gotten emails from all of them saying, hey, our doors are closed right now. Check out our digital catalog. Yeah. <laughs> and people who have been relying on print books for the longest time now are being pushed to these digital solutions and trying their library system for audiobooks and ebooks for the first time ever. I've been and using uh, Libby, which is Libby is Overdrive's app uh, because our local library has Overdrive uh, yep. and Hoopla because they also have Hoopla. And so between the two, uh, I've got to try out all kinds of like new authors that I've had not heard before without any of the, um, you know, without any real, uh, cost to me, which has been great. And I yeah. do go on to buy, like when I find an author I like at the library, I go on to buy their books because I want to support them. Um, but the great thing is even with through the library systems, they're getting paid. Um, yes. So um, yeah, that's a common misconception. Yeah. People think that because patrons are able to check out the books for free, that that means the books are just free and you don't get paid. That's not the case. You get paid as an author when a book sells in the library system. There's two main, um, there's two main models, business models in the library system that's probably worth going over. Yeah. In fact, actually, Mark Leslie from Drafted Digital was recently on the podcast with Joanna Penn, the creative yeah, pen, yeah. just talking about libraries for like an hour. If you're interested in diving deeper in libraries, I would totally recommend that episode because it is wonderful. They go really in depth. They talk about all kinds of stuff that we would never have time to talk about here just because yeah. they're spending a whole hour just on libraries. But I'll just try to hit the, the, the highlights. So there's two ways that your book sells in libraries. One is a librarian buys it. And when a librarian buys it, they get to circulate it in their catalog basically forever. So for the rights to continually circulate that book, they're going to pay a higher price than a consumer would. Generally, we recommend two to three X, whatever your retail list price should be your library list price. So if you're selling your book for 10 bucks in you know, Apple and Google, you're gonna wanna sell it to 30 bucks, 20 bucks to a library. It kind of depends on how competitive you wanna be to attracting uh, the librarian's eyes. And a lot of times when um, patrons will request your book, this is how it gets bought. Uh, if a patron can't find your book in the catalog and they ask the librarian for it, they'll almost always buy it. Yeah. So it's a really good like, their marketing message is, is, if you can't find my book at your local library, ask your librarian or yeah, request the book from the library. I always tell people who are coming out of Kindle Unlimited and they say, you know, I, I came out, but now my readers are complaining because they can't get my book for free yeah. with Kindle Unlimited. Well, they're paying $10 a month for Kindle Unlimited, but you can let them know, hey, my books are now available through the local library systems. Uh, if they don't have your book uh, right then, the reader can request it and yeah. libraries have budgets set aside for requests. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, you were mentioning this first model is the like one, you, they purchase it, they purchase one copy. It treats it like a physical copy. So only one person can check it out at a time. That's right. Uh, so there's uh, hold else in the hold. Um, yep. There's the other, which I, I'm sure you're about to get to, which is the cost for checkout, or I've heard it called a couple of different things. It has a bunch of different names. So don't get confused if you see different services. Call, it's called pay per use. It's called cost per checkout. It's called cost per listen. It's called it's called a whole bunch of different things. Uh, we call it cost per checkout. And I think draft to digital does too. But basically, this is like your library just became Netflix. And instead of there being this tiny catalog that the librarians control and curate, every book in the system is open up to the patrons. And when a patron search for searches for it, it's there. The librarian yeah. doesn't have to purchase it first. It's just there. The whole catalog's open. And when I, as a, as a patron, say, yes, I want to listen to this book, then a small charge gets gets back to uh, the library, which then gets passed to the author. And it's usually, you know, it's 50 cents or a dollar. Instead of that 20 or $30, it's much smaller. But you don't have that gatekeeper there of a librarian who has to get the attention of the, the indie author and buy it or have the request from the patron. It's just there and you can mobilize your audience. And you as, just go many, search as for many it. people as want to at the same time can check it out. So like yes. let's say you you had a, a radio interview with a, like local news. Um, 10 people could go check it out and you're going to get paid by all 10 yep. um, in the future. Like you know, over, over time with uh, the one uh, copy method, you get paid a lot up front, but then you don't get paid anything for any other person checking out in the future. Yep. Um, with and, and don't, I mean, don't sleep on this. The, yeah. you're thinking like thinking those 50 cents or a dollar transactions don't add up is a huge mistake. 
Yeah. I am, um, music I'm studios waiting. have shown they're more profitable than ever now. Uh, Spotify, Apple Music, um, getting paid like the little chunks, but opening it up to where everyone can read whatever they're thinking about right at that moment uh, is really powerful. It adds up. I'm writing some real checks, royalty checks every month uh, just for libraries. And, and, and I do want to be upfront about the two models, right? Like the, the paper use model is a huge boon for indies yeah. because in that librarian model, it's still weighted really heavily towards the big publishers that have the huge multi-million dollar marketing budgets and have the huge demand from the, the, the patrons. So excuse me, hold on. Sorry, just had to clear my throat there. So I would say like 10 to one pay per use by dollars, by revenue dollars for author royalties, 10 to one pay per use is more popular than the library system. It's great to be in both. Anytime the librarian makes a sale at 20 or 30 bucks, that's awesome. That is a really good sale. You, you want to be there, but like, Paper use is where it's at. And we're seeing unbelievable growth in that, especially over the past couple of weeks when you know, every library, every library is sending uh, emails to their patrons saying, check out our digital catalog. And this paper use is there and there's no hold yeah. list and the whole catalog's there. It's awesome. And it's not just the libraries. I'm seeing a lot of articles like just out there at, at the different uh, news platforms. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of, um, the Apple uh, store, uh, their, their app store, they just recently featured uh, like Libby and Hoopla and all the different uh, ways you can download uh, some free content while you're stuck inside. A, for yourself, but B, also for your kids um, because yeah. odds are your kids are driving you nuts at this point and you want to entertain <laughs> them or something. So, uh, okay, let's move on because we're, we're starting to get close to that half hour mark. Um, sure. Marketing. So, um, my favorite thing about distributing through you guys is the pricing control that people now have over most of the platforms and how that's giving them some uh, marketing options. So if you, if you could talk about that and then some of the ways you're seeing people market their audiobooks. Yeah, for sure. Price control is huge. The ability to set your price on an audiobook sounds so basic, right? <laughs> it sounds like, how is that a feature? I, I think it surprises people when they, when they realize, oh, I don't have that at Audible. Like it, I just hear Amazon price it however you want to. Yeah, exactly. So when you use ACX or when your book's on Audible, you don't have any control of your price. It's largely based on duration. They have a chart on their, on their website to show you about what it's probably going to be priced at based on the, the length. But if you want to discount your audiobook, sorry, you can't. Uh, you can use the review code to give it away for free, but it, you're not making, you know, you're no longer making a royalty on that. Yeah. But, and, and, um, and so when people, when we opened up find away voices, I was surprised by how much price control was uh, both a huge confusion point for authors, but also like our, our biggest marketing message. Like the thing that surprised people the most, like I can actually set the price on this. Like I have a 10 hour audiobook and I can make it $2 on sale for a month. Or yeah. I can have the normal price be eight ninety nine, which looks really attractive against the cri the price of a, a credit at fifteen dollars on Audible, and I can you know siphon uh, readers to somewhere where I'm making a lot more higher royalty rates. Like it's crazy. Uh, the one thing that we built uh, about six months ago was a pricing recommender. Oh, actually, so we realized as people were coming through, they were like, oh, "Oh, this is awesome," but I have no idea what an audiobook should cost. Right? Like it's not it's not as straightforward as you think. Now, if you think your audiobook should cost whatever Audible says it should cost, think again, okay? Because the way Audible works, you got to think about, you got to kind of reverse engineer how this works. Audible works by charging uh, a listener fifteen dollars a month for a credit that they get to change, they get to turn this credit into an audiobook, right? And so, if your audiobook is listed on their site at less than fifteen dollars, it looks like you just made a bad deal. Yeah. <laughs> the, the the price of the books have to be as high as possible, so it looks like, oh my god. That book's 22 bucks and I got it for the price of a credit. That looks really good. That credit system doesn't exist on Google, Apple, Scribd, Kobo, all the other places. It doesn't, you know, it, yeah. it people are just paying for it. And so your book needs to be priced more aggressively there than $15. Um, not to mention you're going to people are outright buying the book. They're not using a credit to get it. Um, yeah. Google, or I'm sorry, Kobo does have their own audio service where it does have some credits. They do. Uh, but people can buy ad hoc. Um, I've been excited lately. The Apple Store has been both featuring and running a lot of great deals on audiobooks. And so, uh, indies audio, too. audiobooks under $5. I've seen some free first in the series, uh, audiobooks under $10. And so, 
they really doing a great job promoting yeah. uh, indies too, not yeah. just big pubs. Like the audiobooks team is crushing it over there. I love yeah. it. It's yeah. great. It's been amazing. Yeah. So, so price is a big one. Running promotions too. You don't just set your list price. You can set promotion prices. We have this big right into the dashboard just for two retailers right now, Chirp and Apple. You can set up uh, you know, a time box price. So if you want to put your book on sale at either one of those retailers for a little bit, you can do that right in the website. And then occasionally we'll have other promotional opportunities that we'll email you about and say, uh, you know, we're we're running this carousel or we're helping, you know, this partner run a carousel right. for this genre. Would you like to be in it and discount your book to be part of that? So you'll get those too if you're on our email list. Um, and and as far as author marketing, the one that I really got to talk about is Chirp, yeah. right? So this is BookBub's new audiobook service. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, check out Chirp Books. Sign up um, for it. Like I, I've gotten so many great deals from it. Uh, it's, it's daily book, deals for audiobooks. Great, yeah. Deeply discounted. Yeah. Like, you know, buck 99, 99 cents for an audiobook, which is kind of unheard of in the industry. And it's really, oh man, it's so exciting to be on there. But it's also just a full retailer. So, what a lot of people don't realize it's not just daily deals. Chirp is a full retailer. Like, they have your book just for sale every day. And they do a straight 10% discount off of anything that isn't, um, isn't like a daily deal. But you know, if you get a daily deal for book one, uh, book two, three, four are available through the same platform. Now, the way they're structured is interesting, though, because when you get the daily deal, you don't link out to the retailers, right? Right, and it's, and um, it makes sense. Front, yeah, it makes sense because you can't discount on Audible. How yeah. would you run a BookBub like service without yeah. linking out to I Audible? About that. Out? that makes perfect sense. Why they did so, it that way. So they are the retailer. They control it. They let you discount the prices. It. And they are attracting readers like gangbusters. It is so fun to watch that. Uh, they're out. They're out of like the waitlist. Um, they're still in beta. They're out of a waitlist though. You can write on your partner dashboard. You can look for audiobook yeah. deals right on your BookBub partner dashboard and submit an audiobook deal right there. And if you get it there, everything's taken care of. We have a really tight integration. You and don't have to change anything on the Findaway Voices dashboard. You just you know, it's they're, it's, they're it's actually the follow up to you tomorrow. Uh, so we're having, I think, Carl oh, good. from Book Bob is going to oh, be Carl, on and awesome. talk to uh, to Mark, and so we're really excited about that because um, she's great. I'll have to tune in and start throwing some hardball yeah. questions. Oh yeah, <laughs> tackle her. So we're kind of right at that point to start uh, looking at some questions. Yeah. Um, I see Readsify on here saying, "Yay, Libby!" I love that. <laughs> yes. Uh, so the, the first one I wanted to, to tackle was from Anthony St. Clair. Uh, I released a short uh, story ebook monthly wide, uh, not in KU, and a novel annually in an ongoing fantasy magical realism series. How are authors using audio for standalone short story releases? Man, that's great. That's a great question. Um, so it depends on how short the short stories are. I would say if they're really short, you need to be aware that there's a one hour minimum charge. So if your book is only going to end up being a half an hour long, you're going to get charged for a full hour. So you might want to bundle two or three together to have to get, a get bit, to about ten thousand words. To get to at least ten thousand words, so you're not just throwing money away, right? And and, and that's just um, that's something to help protect the narrators from. They they do a lot of work to set up their environment and edit and master and get to know a piece. Like they they're we don't want to prorate below one finished hour for them. So um, you might you might need to bundle up a couple to do it once to make it more economical, and then you can kind of split it apart. Um, I've seen a lot of short stories gaining traction, and a lot of it is because of the price control, right? Yeah. When you don't have price control on HCX and Audible, and that's your only sales outlet, what's a 30-minute or a, a one-hour book going to do for you when the majority of sales happen from the credit, somebody just paid 15 bucks for this credit. There's no way yeah. they're spending it. They can get one hour of your audio or two hours of your audio, or they can get the Brandon Sanderson, his most recent fantasy novel. That's 55 hours long for the same credit. <laughs> for a credit. Yes, exactly. Now that's not to say that nobody buys a book outright on audible and that's the only, the credits are the only way to buy it, but that is the vast majority. So yeah. I would say price aggressively consider doing audio only for some short stories to see how much of your audience will cross over to a different format. Um, you know, audiobooks are generally more expensive than eBooks. And if you can convert more over, that's higher royalties for you. And just see how fungible your audience is. And, and, and it's also a way I've seen a lot of people dip their toe into audiobooks with short stories before they invest in the full length series, just because it's cheaper. Yeah. I can spend 500 bucks and make these, you know, two or three short stories, test the waters, see how they sell, how are they doing in libraries? How are they doing in retail? Where am I focusing my marketing efforts before I decide that I'm going to go both feet, jump in the pool 
and make and make the real investment for the the full length audiobooks. Yeah. Uh, so we have someone also our, our same thing with Anthony uh, just mentioning that he listened to that creative pen uh, op, creative pen podcast uh, <laughs> with Mark uh, Lefave and Joanna Penn uh, talking about uh, library systems and how to get into them. Uh, great, great podcast. Highly recommend it. Yep. We've got uh, Lexi Green. I love seeing the big push for libraries when it comes to indie ebooks and audiobooks. Uh, I sure do too. Like it's been, you know, five, six years ago, there was definitely a stigma against indie published works. And it was very hard to get libraries to take a chance on them. Uh, now we routinely are running uh, some promotions, kind of like Will mentioned, they do where they email people out. On the ebook side, we're emailing people about promotions with uh, OverDrive, with a Biblioteca. Um, we have one coming up with Baker and Taylor. And so just the library systems are really enjoying uh, indie authors. A, a lot of indie authors now are bestsellers, you know, just out there because they don't need traditional publishers anymore. Uh, the other thing is there's a huge need for content and the traditional publishers charge uh, considerably more than indies charge for ebook and audio books. And so um, yeah. really good time. Yeah. I, uh, I want to add to, we did, um, we sent out a promotion last week and it was a really tight turnaround. It was only like two or three days that you had yeah. to submit to it. But we, um, we worked with a couple paper use library partners to see, I didn't know, I didn't know how this was going to go. We just opened it up and we said, Hey, are there any authors there who would be willing to just give their books away for free mm -hmm. for the month of April to help libraries out? Because remember, or, or not remember, but you may not know this in the pay per use model, you can imagine a readership or patron base going so crazy that the library runs out of money, yeah. right? Like what if a billion people checked out a book today, how much would I owe? So they have like daily, weekly, monthly limits to make sure that they can't go over that. And then once you, once they hit that weekly limit or whatever, you may go to check out a book and they'll say, ah, check back next week, right? But if you can have a catalog of free books that when your budget runs out, you can still point them to these free books that don't impact your budget at all, then you have unlimited listening. And and so we, we said, okay, would authors be willing to give away these books for free? And and it's amazing. Like we don't, we only make money when the authors make money. First of all, we didn't talk about how fine a way to make money, but like yeah. when a book sells for free, I'm not seeing any money. Uh, so it's not like, you know, it's, it's very generous of the author. Um, but it's also just not something that happens quite a lot. And I was blown away by the response, like hundreds of authors and almost 600 titles submitted for this promotion to just give them away for free. Like unbelievable. The author community is so cool. I, I was just so heartwarmed by it. I think they definitely see the value of um, building lifelong readers. And so uh, libraries are one of the best ways to of discoverability out there and to help them. You know, it's not just about selling the book right now. It's about selling your books for the rest of that reader's life and your life. Yep. Um, we, we, were, we recommended series starters for this, yeah. right? Yeah. For, for that reason. But I was blown away by how many standalones were, were, were submitted too. And right. how many just like, yeah, just like you're really, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna help the rest of the series sales here. You're just doing it out of the goodness of your heart. That's what yeah. really like blew me away. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier, but uh, I, I wanted to draw out this comment from Read Sify. Uh, yeah, yeah. Libby. If you're an indie author and you have not checked out Libby, you really, really should. Um, with this is over this is one of overdrive's listening apps yeah and, and i don't think it's the the adults they also have one for kids as well right yes um i forget what that one's called it's um it's another cute, cute yeah. uh name but but i think the overdrive app is still the default so if you've been using overdrive and the overdrive app you just download Libby, you log in with the same information. It's like a whole new UI. It it, it's, it's so much awesome. easier. It works with CarPlay, which I'm a huge tech geek. And so I love it that I, with my Apple phone, I plug it in, I can listen to my audio books in my car. Uh, yeah. So really, really easy. Um, and a cute little branding plan words, Libby the librarian. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's good. Odds are your library works with EverDrive. They're by far the biggest uh, library provider. Um, if you don't already have a library card, a whole lot of different library systems are letting you sign up for a card 
remotely through, uh, I, I believe it's through the Overdrive app, or maybe you go to their website. Um, you know, they, they check a couple of things to make your, sure you're a resident in that town. Um, but like, you don't even have to go into the library to sign up for that. And it can be a lot of resources for you and uh, potentially for your children. Yeah, and your state library might be working with them too. So I know yeah. like, uh, you know, I live in Ohio, the Ohio, Ohio State Library works with them and you can get a library card through the state library and, and you know, check out that catalog and your local library catalog and kind of double your chances of finding a book with a license available. So I had a question from Tori, does Findaway offer translation for audio? Great question. So we, we will produce audio in just about any language. We have support for, I think, 18 languages and dialects right now, but we don't do the translations. Um, so, you know, as you probably know, it's not a good idea to just throw your book in Google Translate and take whatever comes <laughs> out the other end. Translation is an art in itself and it requires a lot of uh, hard work and it's expensive. So we don't just do like the automated translation. If you have had your book professionally translated, you can absolutely upload that manuscript. We will pair you with a narrator who's competent uh, in that language and dialect that you want. And we will help you produce that, that audio book. Even if you can't speak that language and you have no idea how to proof it, it can still be done. You can still make an audio book. Uh, and we support a lot of different languages. Now, you may not get five to 10 choices in every language. You know, we're, we're thinner in some languages than others, but surely like French, Spanish, uh, you know, uh, most of the European languages, Italian, like we're, we're pretty, pretty deep benches on those, on those languages. Might check out your Navajo, uh, translators and narrator <laughs> from Anthony. Can individual audio titles be bundled into collections? Yes, absolutely. It's a great strategy. I'm having a lot now. Yeah. Uh, you just have another thing to sell. It's actually good for a couple of reasons. One, we talked about, we keep talking about this credit system model and how the longer books are more attractive to- You to kind readers. of do have to because Audible is the biggest player in the audio market. However, one thing that I've, I noticed that a lot of indies don't seem to know is that Audible is not nearly as dominant in audio as Amazon is in eBooks. And so- Yeah, yeah Audible's not 80, 90% of the market. Yeah. It's closer to 50, maybe 40. You know, we're tracking that a lot. It, it's it's hard to guess. They don't, you know, obviously put a whole lot of public knowledge <laughs> out there for us to glean, but but it's not, I mean, I'm, you know, 30% of our sales come from libraries. I, I, I tell <laughs> authors really the most important choice, you know, with uh, Kindle Unlimited, if you choose to be exclusive with Amazon, it's only a 90 day commitment. Um, the Really the most important choice is choosing to be uh, exclusive with audio or not, because that's going to tie you up for a much longer time. Um, yeah. Like Will said, uh, most cases they'll let you out after a year of exclusivity. Ex I never can say that word, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> however, I, I have heard cases of uh, people where they, they didn't, and legally they don't have to. Uh, and so as everything gets a little bit more competitive in the audio market, I would make the choice up front to not be exclusive in audio because I, I think that's really going to hold you back in the future. Um and so we, we see all these different players have their smart speakers out now. Google mm -hmm. has their Google Minis uh, and Google Home, I believe. Uh, yep. Apple has their HomePod. Um, those are great devices for audiobooks. And so we're just going to see. Um, I don't think there's native audiobook support for the HomePod yet. There's not. You have to stream to it. Uh, like yeah, Apple, you can airplay not, to it. Tim, Apple, if you're watching that right now, go ahead and add uh, <laughs> Audiobook. I do want to get I want to get back to Anthony's question just a yeah, little I've, bit more though. So so um so Anthony, uh, you know, on the bundling, the longer your book, the more likely it is to sell for that credit model that purchase there. But also, it's another thing to sell, right? You got say these three individual books that you're selling, and then you bundle it up. Now you have four things to sell. Now when somebody does a search, four search results are going to be dedicated to you instead of three. It's just a really good strategy for that. I will say on Audible, you have to be careful because you can only bundle titles up one way. So you can't reuse individual books in two different bundles. So say you have a six book series, you can bundle one, two, and three, you can bundle four, five, and six, but you can't do that and bundle one through six, or you can't do one, two, three, and two, three, four, and four, five, six. Like you can't do it like that. You can only bundle individuals once. So think really like hard and strategically about how you want to bundle those on Audible. No other retailer has that restriction. If you wanted to bundle one, two, and three, and two, three, and four, and four, five, and six on everywhere else, you can do that. It's just Audible is going to reject it. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that, but but there's some legitimate reasons why you might want to bundle things in a couple of different ways. Um, like one interesting one is bundling two through six, right? 
and then marketing really hard to everybody who bought number one because they're yeah. going to feel like they've already bought one sixth of it if they you know those are those are kind of basic things but yes you can absolutely uh bundle individual titles and audio makes sense we're getting close to the 45 minute mark so i wanted to close out on just talking about uh how you guys get paid. We talked about with um, production, um, you do get a cut of the uh, the production, um, but then with distribution, what is your payment model? Yeah, the distribution model is really, really simple or really complex depending on how you look at it. Let's look at it simply, which is you keep 80% of the royalties you earn. It's that simple. Uh, we have a 20% distribution fee. So all the royalties you earn, you're gonna see those and then you're gonna get a check for 80% of that. That's how we make money. So our incentives are aligned. I love that. The more you make, the more we make, you know, we're not just paying, like you're not paying us a monthly fee to do our job. And then we don't care whether your book sells or not. It's just, it's a, a much healthier way to align uh, our incentives there. And so we're incented to like make your book sell and like get it in all these promotions that are coming through and, and include it there. Um, the complicated thing is each retailer that we work with, we work with 43, I think, library and retail partners, they all have different terms. So it's not yeah. a really easy thing. Like if your book sells for $10, it's gonna make this over here and that over there and this over there and this over there. And so we have all those details really cleanly laid out um, in schedule C of our distribution agreement. So you have to sign up for Findaway Voices, then you can see the agreement. Contractually, we're not allowed to put this publicly because of some agreements with, with partners. So you have to, it has to be behind a login. So you just sign up for Findaway Voices, you see the distribution agreement, scroll down to schedule C, and then you'll see this big table with like, this one's based on this price. This one's not based on this price. This is how this is calculated. This is how this one's calculated. Here's the ones that pay 45%. Here's the ones that pay 50%. In general, um, retail um, a la carte sales, like what you imagine like paying for a book on Apple is like, is like 45 to 50% of the list price. Credit subscription models are usually about 32%. The exception is Audible, obviously, which is 25% of whatever they decide to sell it for. They don't base it off of this price. Subscription models, and pool models, generally a little bit smaller payouts, but wider audience. And then the library, those two models that we talked about earlier. With the audio market, uh, I, I know this varies a lot in the ebook market. There's some of the major retailers, we get estimates like the next day, but there's a lot of mm -hmm. uh, our partners that so we don't hear uh, like how much sold or for a, a month or two, or sometimes even three. Yeah. Um, it, I, I think the audio market is more where you don't hear directly as much. Yeah, it's a little, so it, you know, the 43 partners that we have, we have varying levels of integrations with each of them. Some work really closely with us as our, as their exclusive distributor. They get every one of their audiobooks from find a way. So every time they make a sale, we know about it within seconds. And we pass that information along to you on your real time sales dashboard. Others report monthly, others report quarterly to us. So you get paid within 30 days of when we get the money, um, which could be quarterly for like Storytel, for example, pays quarterly. So I can't pay you every month for, for Storytel, but I'll pay you within 30 days of when I get paid. And that's why like the, the yeah, we have to do the same thing. Because just not everyone, uh, people forget it. Like traditional publishing, they pay people um, very, very slowly. Yeah. Um, and, and so there's a lot of different partners that we work with that just can't tell us every day or, or, or even every week or every month. And, uh, and some of the models, it just doesn't make sense either. Yeah, so like, yeah. for example, on a, on a pool model that's based on the total listening for the month and your share of that total listening and their subscriber count and their subscriber revenue, like they only calculate that once a month. So you, like, we don't know mid month really how it's going. We have some yeah. indicators, <laughs> but like, I can't give you daily sales on Scribd. I, I just can't because we don't know what daily sales are because it's not calculated till the end of the month because yeah. it's based on some other factors that aren't as easily uh, transcribed as like, this was a transaction that happened. Like I handed you money and you gave me an audiobook. It's not that simple anymore. So it's, there's a lot of complexity around managing the relationships between 43 different partners and compiling it all into one nice, neat sales report that you get monthly. Yeah. Well, we're kind of at that time. Uh, I did want to share with you, um, if, if you sign up for a hey, draft to digital, we've been working with find a way. We were the first people that worked with them. Uh, we've built in on, we launched together. Sure. Uh, we, we have a lot of integration. And so if your book is already up at uh, draft to digital, you can go to the audio book tab and uh, learn, like sign up for their process. It kind of walks you through. Uh, we send them over a lot of your metadata so you don't have to re-enter all that. Uh, you also save on their $49 casting fee so they don't charge that for you. Um, and so you can kind of start the process with no upfront costs. 
Um, there's no so, difference in your royalty rate. There's no, like, no. it doesn't cost you anything. You absolutely, if you're dressed a digital customer, you should absolutely be clicking that button. Yeah, uh, sign, that up, sign up for find a way through draft to digital because it's going to save you forty nine dollars. So absolutely, yep. Uh, check out find a way voices at findawayvoices dot com. And thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, we have tomorrow at noon uh, Carlin Robertson from Bookbub, and so you can ask questions about Bookbub daily sales, about their ads, maybe talk about to them about chirp. Ask them um, about so, chirp. <laughs> yeah, that's my trip and audiobook ads. Audiobook yes. ads are so exciting. Oh, oh audio about ads. that. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh man, that's so exciting. Okay, that's your yeah. teaser. Come yeah. back tomorrow. Have Carlin tell you all about audiobook ads. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Goodbye. Okay. Bye.